Welcome and hello everyone. Welcome to another of our Summer Reading Club book chats. My name is Sadie and I am very excited to be hosting our book chat today where we're going to talk all about books. We have some people here who have some very strong book opinions so I am excited to see what everyone has brought to talk about today. So we are looking at our Spaceopoly board. So this is for our adult and teen summer reading club. And today we are going to be focusing on our shuttle categories. So here we go, we have our shuttle. We have four shuttle categories on our board. We have shuttle to the past. We have shuttle to Africa. We have shuttle to Central South America and the Caribbean. And we have shuttle to the Middle East and India. So these books will take us around the world in book form. So I'm very excited to see what everyone has brought for us today. Luckily, as I said, I am not alone here. I don't have to sit here and talk to myself about books. I have four wonderful colleagues who are joining me today. So I would like to welcome everybody here today. Hello. Hey. Hello. We have Fiona. Virginia, Kareen, and Liz joining us today. And I hope you are as excited as I am to talk shuttle categories today. Before we get started though, I have a question for all of you. So what I want to know is speaking and thinking about books from around the world, do you find that there is a particular area of the world that you gravitate towards in your reading selections? What do you think, Fiona? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually had a hard time finding a book today because I was like, oh yeah, I read lots of like um, literature set in different places. Turns out it's all in Asia and we don't have a shuttle to Asia. So like I like to read about Japan and Korea and China. Um, that tends to be where I gravitate. All right, very cool. Uh, what about you, Virginia? No, I would say no. Most of the books that I read are set in worlds that don't exist. So that's where I gravitate towards. Completely fair. Very fair. <laughs> How about you, Kareen? Is there a particular area of the world that you, you tend to gravitate towards? Um, I think that this year I've just been a little bit more deliberate. There is a good old bookstagrammer hashtag called Read Caribbean, which was created in 2019 um, by some Caribbean book bloggers, including Book of Since, C-I-N-Z. And it was just to kind of like highlight different upcoming Caribbean authors, um, different works, um, specifically target targeting like uh, women or um, LGBTQ authors. So I've just been kind of like pick, trying to pick up more authors from that area, just kind of inspired by that and have found some really fantastic reads. So yeah, interested in everything, but trying to be a little bit more deliberate this year. Very cool. I like that. And Liz, what about you? Do you gravitate towards a specific part of the world? I think a lot of the fiction that I've been reading, sort of my go-to fiction is um, set in Japan because I do like a lot of translations from Japanese. Um, also starting to get more into Korean fiction, which is kind of um, kind of having a rise, I guess. Um, and then also a lot of North American stuff. So I um, was really happy for today's topics, the shuttles, because then it kind of highlighted, you know, maybe I can um, pay more attention to what titles are from other parts of the world, um, because I found that I'm missing out, I feel. So I need to read more of these books. How about you, Fair Sarah? enough. Yeah, I, I definitely gravitate towards uh, the UK, Ireland, and Scotland. I, um, I enjoy visiting that part of the world. I also enjoy reading about that part of the world. But I think similar to Corrine, uh, this year specifically, I have um, started reading kind of more focused uh, works. And um, I've started reading quite a bit of, of work that comes out of Africa, which I've been really, really enjoying as well. Um, so kind of learning, learning about uh, different authors and new authors and getting some really, really great books as well. All right, well, on that note, I think we are going to get right into it. Uh, so we're going to start with Fiona. So Fiona, if you wanna tell us what your first pick for this category is. I think you are muted, Fiona. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My first book is for Shuttle to the Past. Uh, so it is a historical fiction. And I have chosen um, the most popular of historical fiction topics, World War II. Um, so my book is Codename Verity by uh, Elizabeth Wine. And um, probably a lot of the really bookish people out there have already read this, uh, and maybe even a long time ago. So it came out in 2012, but it's just like, it is definitely on my top 10 favorite books of all time. Uh, so I was excited to get a chance to talk about it. So, um, yeah, as I said, this is uh, about World War II, and it's about espionage and female pilots. Um, we have sort of two uh, narrators, and the first narrator is um, <clears throat> a prisoner of the Gestapo, uh, and she was on a spying mission, and, and it got cut short um, because pretty much as soon as she stepped off the plane, she looked the wrong direction uh, on the road. And that is you know, a pretty good indication um, that you are not from there. So after all of this work of uh, memorizing her secret identity and preparing, um, uh, it, she got caught pretty immediately. Um, and then we have uh, another um, storyline of a, a female pilot who has crashed uh, and she's stuck in France. And she um, she's not even supposed to be there uh, because women weren't allowed to, uh, to fly to that extent. They were only sort of allowed to do routine flights. Um, and she ends up falling in with um, a resistance group. And so we kind of have those parallel stories going. Um, and it, it's about friendship. Um, it's about bravery. Um, and it's just, it's just so well written. And I, I actually listened to it the first time um, as an audiobook. Oh, and it's so gripping and emotional and I just cried and cried and cried all through it. So I can definitely see this as a, as a tearjerker. Um, if you, yeah, if you haven't picked it up uh, and you and you like historical fiction or if you like World War II historical fiction, like it's definitely fundamental. Um, it is a YA, but it's definitely reads a lot older. Uh, I think uh, adults will enjoy it for sure. Um, I'm trying to think what else kind of I, it kind of came to my mind because I've, I've got the the like sequel on my shelf and I've been meaning to read it forever. <laughs> um, if you're looking for something with lots of intrigue, um, something that has lots of surprises and unravels sort of slowly, um, you know, that focuses on powerful women and um, female friendships. Uh, it's definitely a great book to pick up. Wonderful. I also absolutely loved that book. And I I would love to listen to it as an audiobook, but I would also be very hesitant because like you said, Fiona, I can't imagine those really tense and at sometimes devastating moments in that book being read as an audiobook. Yeah, I, I imagine that would be it was pretty tense it was definitely tense to listen to. but then it was one of those ones that I just I just like kept listening to it because it just like essentially like took up you know a week of my life where that was all I thought about and <laughs> fair enough yeah I can see that wonderful so next up we have Kareen talking about one of her shuttles today Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this was a really uh, excruciating choice to make. And I wanted to choose a book by an author of uh, Jamaican descent, because I think two days ago, it was the 58th anniversary of Jamaican independence. So I kind of wanted to highlight that area. So I went back and forth on the book that I chose. And Here Comes the Sun by Nicole dennis Ben, which was also amazing. But eventually, I made my choice. And I went with uh, The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins. 
And this is a historical book, a little bit of a thriller, a very literary. Um, and it takes place in and around 1820, and all of London is a buzz. There has been a double murder. On trial for this murder is the lady's maid, Franny, who is a former slave who eventually made her way from the plantations of Jamaica into the home of these two benevolent uh, white people who have taken her in, have given her a job, have given her a home, and how does she repay them but to murder them? So the eccentric scientist George Benham is the husband. He is found upstairs in his room. And when the murder is discovered, uh, the wife, his, his handsome French wife, uh, Marguerite, is found in bed with Franny. And the, uh, the corpse of the wife is found drenched in blood and Fanny is curled around her and found sleeping. So when the police happen upon the scene, they immediately arrest Franny and put her on trial for murder. It is a, it's kind of a bit of a little alias grace situation where you are going back in time to find out What's Franny's story? Where does she come from? And how did she get here? How did a former slave who was raised on a plantation with a master who was involved in horrible pseudoscientific experimentations on people find her way eventually into the home of a well-respected London gentleman? And again, how did she find herself in a relationship with her employer's wife. So it is a little bit of a thriller, a little bit of a mystery. Um, it's talking a lot about race and class and uh, it's it's very, very dense. Um, the author Sarah Collins has kind of described it as taking gothic tropes. So if you think about Jane Eyre as your gothic and kind of turning them and twisting them to make you feel that sort of discomfort and that uneasiness that you're supposed to feel when you're reading a gothic, but then also add this little crime element into it. It's a bit of a tour de force. Um, it's very much for people who enjoyed uh, maybe uh, Alias Grace, uh, Washington Black, or who have read uh, Mexican Gothic and are looking for, again, someone taking that, that genre that we think we know, those tropes that we think we know, and kind of turning them on their heads. Um, so that is uh, my pick. Definitely recommend that if you're looking for something dark, something a little bit disturbing, um, something very, very full of depth, um, that you pick this one up. That's the best last line. Looking for something full of full depth. Full of depth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does that image of, of being covered in blood and just somebody curling up? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It sounds like an intriguing story, but I don't know. Not for everyone, no. If I could, no, no, that's fair. That is fair. <laughs> All right. Well, we are turning to possibly our gruesome expert, which may or may not um, affect their choices for today. Uh, we are looking to Virginia to see what Virginia has brought to us for her first shuttle category today. So I think Corinne took the gruesome today. So I'm going to go with something not quite Virginia book, I think, but I love this book so much. I've been wanting to talk about this book since the beginning of summer when we said we're going to do book chats. And I could have done it in the Canadian category because the author is Canadian. Um, but I waited for this one because it, it fits so well into the shuttle category, really, really takes you to the place. And the book that I have for you is Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, so this book takes place in the 1920s um, in Mexico during the Jazz Age and kind of post-revolutionary Mexico. And the story is about Cassiope Cassiopeia, who is 18 years old. She and her mother lives with her grandfather in her grandfather's house with like her big extended family her grandfather is like the rich like landlord in this tiny little town and um even though they're family they treated her she they treated her and her mother like servants because her grandfather used to like her mother was her grandfather's favorite but she went and went to the city and she ran with and got married and so 
like she, he has sort of never forgiven her for that. And now that her father has died, they have moved back and her grandfather's allow them to move back but you know like they treated her really badly especially um her cousin martin who like bully her all the time um so when one day when the family was going on a family trip cassiopeia was told nope you don't get to go you stay home you do housework you know you like you know clean the house and do all that and so she couldn't go on the trip together and so as she was cleaning the place she found a key this key belongs to her grandfather and her grandfather always keeps it on him. So he must have accidentally dropped the key. And she knows that the key opened up this chest that is at the foot of his bed. Nobody knows what's in the chest, but it must be something like valuable, possibly money in there because her grandfather like really, really um, keeps this a secret, right? So she figured, you know what? Nobody wants me here anyway. I don't belong here. I want to go back to the city. That's where I belong. So I'm going to open this chest and see what's in there. Give this money. I'm going to take a bunch of it. I'm going to run away. I'm just going to go. So she opened the chest and then she saw this like, it's full of like bones. And so she was staring at him like, what is this, right? And then she thought, well, maybe there's money hidden underneath because it's probably just to scare people away. So she started like stick her hand in. She started like rummaging through it. And then suddenly she felt like a prick in her finger. And then she took it back out. Her finger was bleeding. And there was a little bone shard that is sort of stuck in her finger. And then she was trying to like, like stop the bleeding. And then she's noticed that the bones are starting to move and the bones are starting to reassemble themselves back into a skeleton and then the skeleton started to have like skin and flesh and suddenly this naked man is standing in front of Cassiopeia and it turns out that this guy is the god of death um, yes, there's still death involved in this book. God of Death, um, he is Hankame who is who used to be the ruler of the Mayan underworld um, however he was tricked by his twin brother and with the help of Cassiopeia's grandfather. And he is basically killed and he they stuff him in a chest. And not only that, they scatter his body parts all around Mexico so that he cannot kind of become whole again, even if he accidentally got out, which he did now because of Cassiopeia. And so he said to Cassiopeia, well, you're coming with me now because we're kind of bound together now because your, your blood is basically what like brought me back to life so to speak and so you're going to come with me we're going to go around mexico and we're going to find the my body like the different body parts and then we're going to go down back to the underworld and we are going to take back what like is mine and i'm going to kick my brother out and cassiope is like well i like not that she really have a choice but she's like well i i was going to run away anyway fine let's go on this quest and so the story takes us all around mexico um and you're gonna meet demons and there's gonna be like monsters there's gonna be like wizards and sorcerers and we're gonna get all different kinds of mayan mythological creatures and some bad messenger owls um and and the offer is going to take us all around and and you're gonna see um sort of the story of of cassiopeia and and Hankame and their relationship as they it changes and what what their relationship changes because now because of of Cassiopeia's blood they're kind of stuck together and every day they are together um Hankame becomes more and more human because of the blood and Cassiopeia is basically every day she dies a little because she's giving all her life to Hankame and and how that relationship changes um and you see this god who thinks so full of himself in the beginning and cold and aloof and, and changing because of Cassiopeia um, and, and what her, like how her character affects him. Um, this is, is, is a very fairy tale like kind of setup and it's beautifully written. Every sentence is, it just begs to be read aloud. Um, and I don't say that about a lot of books, but this, this is just so beautifully written. I, I love the relationship between the two um, and and you get to experience like a different mythology that is different from what we are normal like what we what we used to in a lot of the stories that you found so that was great um, you get the the oh, the full full 
side of this of Mexico and and you get to take all around and and you get to kind of experience all the all the the sights and the scenes and the sounds um it's it's a beautiful beautifully written story I didn't think I would love it as much but this is definitely my favorite book one of my favorite book um that I read this year um it's really really good to know that her books are being re-released um next year by Tor so I'm really looking forward to some of her backlist books that are kind of gone out of print but we we're going to get to be treated with more books um by her and uh, the book that Corinne just mentioned Mexican Gothic is also by her, which is also an excellent, excellent book. Um, and she writes such different kinds of books. And this one I would say is more kind of like a, almost a fairy tale. Um, and, and it's beautiful. Everyone should read it. And so it is Gods of Jay and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. That sounds very, very interesting that I think I'm going to go pick that up very, very soon, Virginia. I realized I just ramble on and on. I really, really love this book so much, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mexican Gothic, mm -hmm. how did you find that? Uh, loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it. I'm just like a couple of pages mm -hmm. from the end, but it's everything that I want. <laughs> so good, so good. I can't wait to read um, God of Jade and Shadow. Mm -hmm. And it has just been yes. optioned yes. by Kelly Rip but to be made into yes. a movie and or TV series. So okay. should we go well, the Mexican Gothic has? Yes. Okay. Very cool. All right. So it's time for Liz to let us know what she has selected for her first shuttle read. Well, I have more murder for you today. Surprise, surprise. Uh, my pick for today for one of the shuttles is my Sister the Serial Killer, and it's by Oyinkan Braithwaite. And she is a debut author um, who is Nigerian, and her story takes place indeed in Nigeria, in Lagos. Um, this book was actually a 2019 Booker Prize nominee, um, and she was heralded as having such a great debut that is um, quote unquote morbidly funny. So it's definitely uh, a sort of a, a dark humor, but um, not skimping on the murder, fortunately. So the two protagonists of this story are two sisters named Koridi and Ayula. Now Koridi is like the, uh, the model child. Now, during this story, they're adults, there are flashbacks to their childhood. So Koridi is sort of the model sister. She's the responsible one, the mature one. Uh, and she has um, gone to become a nurse. So a very respectable profession where she's caring for other people. Now, Ayula is in a way the opposite of her sister. She's younger, she's beautiful, she's flighty. Um, she's very um, impetuous and uh, would always be considered the favorite child in her family. Now, the story opens up with Ayula calling Karidi in a panic because she has a dilemma. That dilemma is that her boyfriend is now dead. To add to that, this is the third boyfriend in a row of Ayula's that has turned up dead by her own hand. Now, by now, Koridi uh, is very uh, methodical in how she helps her sister. And of course, being a nurse, um, she has the practical knowledge on how to help her clean up the blood, leech is key here, and also how to dispose of a body. Uh, now, instead of mourning, as she should be, or at least pretending like she's mourning, um, Karidi needs to rein in Ayula to resist the urge to post selfies of herself on Instagram. So you definitely have two extremes here, and now Koridi has been drawn into protecting her sister and her murderous um, relationships. One day, Ayula visits Koridi at her work at the hospital, uh, and she meets a colleague of Koridi's, a handsome doctor. Now, this doctor ends up asking Koridi for Ayula's phone number, and subsequently, the two begin a relationship. However, Koridi has been in love with this doctor forever and just been waiting for him to notice her. So she's in a bit of a predicament right now. Does she stand by her murderous sister and continue to help her cover up her crimes? 
Or does she save the doctor that she feels she is so in love with? Uh, my sister, the serial killer, is a super romp, um, very fast paced and snappy, a quick read. It would even be probably a great summer beachy read. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, loved seeing a bit of the world in modern day Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and also seeing this absurd premise um, that might even be kind of plausible. So uh, if you're looking for something dark, funny, uh, and yet a quick light read, uh, I definitely recommend this one. A quick light read all about murder. It might my, my kind of read. So, I mean, subjective, right? Your <laughs> yes. mileage may vary. That's fair, that's fair. That is very intriguing. All right, so for my pick, I have chosen for my first pick is The Seven Sisters by Lucinda Riley. And uh, this is the first book in a series of um, seven books that I don't think all of them are released yet. Um, and it follows a set of sisters, as the name suggests. Um, it follows six sisters who were all adopted when they were babies from different parts of the world. And they were all brought to uh, this beautiful home in Switzerland on Lake Geneva uh, by this man that they know as their father and they know him as Pa Salt is what they call him. Uh, so they've all been brought together. They've all been raised, given kind of no expense spared for giving them the most beautiful life, um, anything that they wanted. Uh, but also making making sure that they work hard and they know they know what it takes um, to earn money themselves and kind of this ideal childhood. Uh, so each of the sisters has now gone off their separate ways, um, and this book follows the oldest sister Maya. And Maya and her sisters have all been named. Pasalt gave them all names that had um, names of the stars in the Seven Sisters star cluster in the Pleiades. So each one has a different name of a different star. And this one follows Maya, the eldest sister. And it starts when Maya is called and told that her father has died. And not much is known about his death, um, but it brings all six of the sisters back to this house in Lake Geneva. So they all gather in this house to find that his request, their father's request, was that he be buried at sea before any of them were told about his death. So none of them have had the chance to mourn him. None of them have had the chance to attend his burial. Uh, so they've all gathered back at this childhood home together to, to say goodbye to their father and maybe learn a little bit more about what has happened. So each of them, uh, the lawyer comes to talk with all of them and each of them is given a letter, an object, and coordinates on a map. And this is to begin their journey to find out where they came from. So growing up, they were never really told or never really asked that much about where they had been adopted from or what their, their kind of family's backstory was. So each of the sisters is given something to start their journey to find out who they are. So Maya, as the eldest sister, she decides that she will follow the coordinates and her coordinates lead her to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And this is sort of the beginning of a journey that has her following her great grandmother, Isabella, back to the 1920s uh, through World War II and eventually helps her to learn where she came from and what her, what her family is um, and kind of what her background is. So it's a story about her learning about herself, learning about her family. Uh, it is a journey or a shuttle to uh, Central South America as well as a shuttle to the past. So it does check off both of those boxes. Um, as I said, it is the first of a series. Each of the books in the series follows a different sister and follows the sister's story um, to a different part of the world to learn where they came from. Uh, it is great if you're a fan of Kate Morton or Susanna Kearsley, very similar uh, styles of writing, very similar stories. Um, just a very touching, intriguing kind of family story as well as um, a look into the past and uh, kind of a sweeping, sweeping story about different generations and how they're all linked together. So that is The Seven Sisters by Lucinda Riley. Mm -hmm. 
know you love a series, Sadie. I do. I do love a series. I really do. Yeah. And this one, I mean, it's it's not even done yet. And when you know going into it, there's going to be seven books. It's just, it's, yeah. It's, it's very smart. It's very smart. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> 17 guaran seven guaranteed series. Guaranteed. Yeah. I'm very curious what the last book is going to be, though, because there's only six sisters. So the last one, there, there is talk of a mysterious seventh sister that they all expected to arrive at some point, and she never did. So, Ooh, or it ends mm. in murder. Maybe. <laughs> Only one sister <laughs> left standing. <gasps> Fight to the death. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't see how it would take that turn so drastically, but you never know. You never know what would happen. <laughs> All right. Well, before we move on to our next shuttle categories or our next shuttle picks, I have a question that I would like to ask all of you. And my question for you today is, do you reread books? Are you book rereaders or do you read it once and then set it aside and move on to something else? Uh, so let's start with Kareen. Are you a book rereader? I am. Uh, I have, I don't, I mean, I own a lot of books, but I don't own a ton of books. And I only kind of keep and buy the books that I know I'm going to reread. And there are books that I reread like the same time every year, like fall time is to reread the uh, Anne of Green Gables and the entire manga series of Emma. So I, I love a good reread. Nice. I like that. I like the different times of year. That's uh I used to do that when I was a kid. I used to have a Christmas book that I would always read every single Christmas. That was, was very exciting. Uh, we're going to go to Liz. Liz, are you a book re-reader? Uh, no, I have considered it. Um, but I just feel like I don't have enough time to even read all the books that are new to me that I want to read. Um, and also, I think part of me is afraid of not being able to relive the magic that I may have experienced with a book. Like there's some books that I've rated maybe five stars on Goodreads, and I'm almost afraid to go back uh, and read them because I'm in a different time and place in my life. And back then, you know, these books may have been so um, profound to me. And uh I think I'd be really sad if I, I, I went back and read something and it just What if it's not the same? Anymore. What if you don't get the same experience? No. It's fair. Yeah, exactly. What about you, Fiona? Do you reread books? I'm on the same page as Liz. Uh, no. And it's like part of that fear. Like and sometimes things don't age well. Um, and it can be good to know when you go back and read something and then you realize that it's not uh, not aged well um, but definitely that fear that you just you're just not coming to something at the same time and it might not mean as much to you um, the, the exception is uh, sometimes like um, kids books and um, uh, graphic novels I will reread because they're they're quick and I don't know <laughs> this is shocking Shocking. I was going to say, Kareen's face looked devastated when you said that. <laughs> All right, let's let's see how the rest of the team feels. Virginia, do you reread books? Nope. Nope. The same thing, same as Liz. Totally agree. There's way too many books. I don't, I can't. Um, the only book, and same with Fiona, the only book I would say that I reread occasionally is when I feel really, really, I just need something to cheer me up. This is the only book I reread all the time. Dory Fantastamogori, the only book that is worth rereading. When I'm sad, when I feel like I just need something to cheer me up, this this is it. This is it. Um, so yeah, so no rereading, just that. Um, and what Fiona said is totally true, like, because you realize that some of the books you may, it might become, like, they don't, like, books that are written really long time ago, like, I, I try to read um, the Jim Butcher book this year again the first book because it was 20th anniversary so I'm like oh I'll read that again and like no I stopped <laughs> you know you, you realize maybe it's not what you remember it to be and and I yeah so yes so Dory Dory is the only book that I need to reread ever 
All right, we are sitting three to one for rereaders right now. Come on, Sadie. Come on, Sadie. <sighs> Back the road. I'm so sorry, Kareen. This is I'm so sorry. Ridiculous. Yay! <laughs> um, so I have reread books. As I said, as a kid, I would reread books. I would read the same book every year at Christmas. I, I feel like I had like a Valentine's Day book. I had a Halloween book. I would have holiday books. But as an adult, I do not reread books anymore. Um, the, as I said, the only exception to that is if a show or a movie is coming out of that book, then I will usually try to reread it before I watch the show or the movie, if it's something that I'm excited about, to remind myself what the original was before I watch the remake. Um, but no, I, I, I agree with, with everyone, apart from Kareen, that there's just <laughs> not enough time. There's not enough time to get through all of the books that I want to read new to go back and read books that I have already read. Read faster. <laughs> that that would be the solution, I suppose. <laughs> this is good. We really didn't have any tension this episode. I was starting to get worried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fine. I haven't told everyone that they're wrong yet. So yeah, bring this in. You're all wrong. It's coming. <laughs> oh, on that uplifting note, we are going to look at our second shuttle picks. So we're going to go back to Fiona and see what else she brought us today for our shuttle category. Thanks, Sadie. So it sounds like um, the my book, uh, All is Beauty Now, might have a lot of crossover with uh, Seven Sisters you were just talking about. So uh, this is set in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, and it is essentially a family drama. Um, and it's set in the 60s. Uh, the family are expats uh, from Canada. So I kind of copped out a little bit on the um, shuttle thing. It takes place in uh, Rio, but it is a Canadian author. Uh, and I think she did live there for some time. Um, so they are a beautiful, happy, charming, rich family. Um, and of course, that's not quite so true underneath the surface. So the family um, is planning to move back to Canada um, when tragedy strikes and the eldest daughter uh, goes missing, presumed drowned. Um, so the, the novel picks up after uh, that incident and uh, we see the family grieving um, the father who is charming, social, um, uh, and just the life of the party. Um, you know, we see him descend into his grief um, and learn that he uh, is actually bipolar. And uh, we have to um, watch as his family tries to balance their life uh, around his manic and depressive episodes. Um, I'm uh, blanking on character names, but uh, there are two younger daughters um, and, you know, until this point haven't really uh, been brought into the realities of um, sort of how messy their family actually is. And through their sister's disappearance, um, really get a wake up call and uh, a fast growing up. Um, the mother is also absolutely charming and everyone loves her. and. Uh, we soon find out that she has had an affair that has, you know, destroyed the foundation of her marriage. Um, and all of this is coming back through, through these flashbacks of, you know, what seems like such a, a wonderful family, uh, when you can really just see them kind of brought to their knees and at each other. Um, they're... It was interesting. I felt I kind of reacted to their richness the same way. I don't know if anyone felt like reading Crazy Crazy Rich Asians, where it was very um, like, on one hand, you were like, oh, like they have servants and it's just like, it's all too much. And they're so snobby and like spoiled. And then also like just these descriptions of these opulent things and just being like, but I want it. <laughs> and like, they're still so, you know, they have so many problems, but they just lead this like exciting, a beautiful life uh, and it was really cool to see uh, Rio in the 60s or to, to hear about Rio in the 60s um, and they the two parents you know 
put on their beautiful clothing and go out and party with their um, with their scholarly friends all night. And you know, the nanny stays home with their children. Um, so it's a really really neat exploration um, of the psychology of a family. And it has lots of twists and turns. Um, and it's very like, uh, kind of like flowery writing. Um, and I did, you know, despite sort of the spoiledness of the characters, I did find them so very uh, uh, sympathetic and it, it kept me engaged the entire way through. So highly recommend it. I have to say, I love a flawed character. I do. I love. I love it when the characters just aren't. Yeah, when they have so many problems, I feel like you can be very sympathetic and you can relate to them um, easier if they're not, if they're not actually perfect. So absolutely, yeah. Very cool. All right, Kareen, what have you brought us for your second pick today? Well, going on my theme of murder, um, I chose another mystery. Um, this one is part of a series, which is the Crown Colony Mysteries by Ovidia Yu. The first book in the series is the Frangipan Frangipani Tree Mystery. And our main character, our main detective is Su Lin. And she is uh, living in Singapore. So she's born in Singapore. She's of Chinese descent. And when we meet her, she's a young girl who is oddly educated. So she has both been educated by the missionaries. So she, she has a lot more education than a lot of the girls, even in her family, because she is also, on the other hand, educated by her canny grandma, who is the unofficial head of the family which are a connected group of money lenders so they are very very well connected in Singapore and so she gets the very proper education on one hand and perhaps a little bit more practical education on the other she wants to be a journalist she wants to travel the world she wants to explore all of these things but she is restricted by being a girl, she's restricted by being Chinese in a British colony, and she's also restricted by the fact that she has a limp from when she had polio when she was a child. Her family um, either, they either give her a choice. She can either get married or she can get a job. And because she doesn't want to get married, she decides to take her grandmother's uh, option and go and become a maid at the police force there where she meets Chief Inspector Thomas Lefroy. While they are discussing the terms of her employment, while well, Sulin would like to be a detective and Lefroy thinks that she should be a maid, they are interrupted by someone rushing to the station who tells them that the Irish nanny of acting Governor Palin's daughter has been murdered. Big deal. So Sulin decides to track along to find out what has happened following her journalistic uh, instincts. And there she uh, just kind of happens to volunteer herself to be the replacement nanny. Uh, while she is there, she uncovers a plot, a little bit of politics, and the, the fact that there might be a murderer stalking the halls of acting Governor Palin. So this is uh, the first in three books that are out so far, The Betel Nut Mystery, The Paper Bark Mystery, and the fourth one is coming out soon called The Mimosa Tree Mystery. They are uh, very cozy, they're very light, but at the same time, you are at a very key point in Singapore's history, so 1936. So there is the British occupation, and then slowly what you see happening through the course of the series is the planned Japanese invasion of Singapore. So it is, uh, I think it has high appeal for people who love historical mysteries, which are a little bit lighter, but you are still learning a lot about Singapore and that particular time and place when you read them. So um, I really enjoy the series. I love her. Um, she also has another series that is set uh, more in the present day, which is the Auntie Lee's Delight series, which are very, very fun. Um, yeah, I think she's a, a really great cozy mystery reader. Um, I love her take on Singapore. She was born and raised there and lives there still. And so you just get a really cool window into, into the time and place. That's how I like my murder. Nice and cozy. Yeah. 
down. <laughs> All right, Virginia, what did you pick for your second shuttle today? So I'm also continuing to explore different mythological worlds with my book. Um, this is uh, taking us back, just like Liz, taking us back to Lagos, Nigeria. This is uh, David Mogo, God Hunter by Nigerian writer Suyi Davis Okumbo. Okumboa. Um, so this is um, a story that takes place after an event called the falling. Nobody really knows why, but what happens is that the gods start coming down to earth and start living in Nigeria. Um, and these gods are like taking up residence in like weird places like your water tanks or you know like in the wells and and they're kind of like you know creating chaos in the city a little bit um and when you found a god that you need to evict and they won't go who do you call you call david mogo the god hunter um david is a demigod himself so he, his mother is a goddess um and his father unknown and his mother has left him in the care of Papa Udi who is a wizard and that's the family that David has always known the only family that he has known um, and when the story starts you know David is uh, got called in by uh, Ajala who is a local I don't know, he's like a ruler a local a, a half wizard but he's like he, he kind of like you know ticks uh, he he controls lagos basically um the police is in the pocket you know he can do whatever he wants and and they kind of look you know the other way um and he has called david mogo in because he would like david to find him the twin gods kahinde and taiwo and david mogo knows you you don't want to get involved with ajala that's a bad bad idea but he needs to put a roof over his family and and in this case literally because his house is like falling apart and the roof has actually caved in so he actually needs to money for the roof so um he's going to um he's like fine i'll go do this right and then you know uh and so he after a fierce battle he managed to capture the brother god taiwo and brought him to ajala and ajala was like well where's the other one and he's like i don't know where she is i can't find her well you better find her or else you're gonna not gonna get the money and so he's like okay fine whatever but he didn't really have to look very hard because when he got home kahinde is waiting for david with you know papa udi being the hostage and kahinde is furious not only because he has captured her brother, but also that they have been trying to evade Ajala for like ever and ever. And then he's, she starts telling David the reason why Ajala needs them. And of course, it's nothing good. And it proves to David again, he knew that he shouldn't have taken this job. Um, and there's nothing good comes out with working with Ajala. So this is a urban fantasy, as you can tell. So it's, things happen in our world, but there's magic, there's supernatural stuff going on. And um, because of that, I think this is really good for this category because it is um, it really takes you to Lagos, Nigeria. The author knows his city. Um, it's alive. It's not just a setting, but you know, every, it, it feels like a story that cannot happen anywhere else, but in Lagos. Um, and it is... Urban fantasy is sort of why I got into fantasy in the first place. So I, I really love a good urban fantasy, even though I don't read as much of it anymore. And it's really nice, again, to have another book that takes place in somewhere else that has a different cultural references, different mythological background to this. And that um, when I was reading more about what you know other people think about this book, I know one of the reviewers said, it's like, well, it's not the author's job to explain to you what's going on. If you don't know the cultural references, if you don't know the myth myths behind it, reader's job to, to figure that out, to put in the work to do that. And I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that he was able to put this book out without having to like, do all the explanation. He just put it out as is, you know, and then, you know, I looking forward to like, you know, like go into more rabbit holes to kind of learn more about the mythology, just like in the other book that I talked about earlier. Um, and I, I love David Mogo. I hope there's more books by, with him in it. Um, he's like, he's a funny, he's a smart mouth, you know, like he, and he hates being like, like half of something because he's a demigod so he really hates that he hates it when you refer him to that as that and and in the book he's he's not just like he's not a static character he's trying to figure out like what 
which half of it, you know, is he? Like, or does he belong anywhere? Because he doesn't feel like he belongs. He's not a god. He's not a human. Um, and and the story is forcing him to kind of reconcile that and try to figure that out. Um, and I also love how he he learns from the beginning until the end that women are not there just for you to protect. You know, like that they can you know stand on their own. They can do their own thing. Um, so that's really lovely. Also, you know, in in the book. Um, so yeah. So uh. You know, if you like a good urban fantasy um, that happens somewhere else, you know, and you can get to know some other kind of gods and, you know, mythological creatures out there, um, I would highly recommend David Mogo, God Hunter. Wonderful. Thank you, Virginia. That does sound really, really interesting. All right, Liz, what did you bring us for your second shuttle pick today? I've got something a little bit different um, than some of the other books presented today. Now, this one is called Persepolis, the story of a childhood, and it's by Marjane Satrapi. Um, now, it is a graphic novel, and it was originally published in the French language, although it does take place in Iran. So um, it's chronicling the author's childhood um, in Iran, um, beginning in 1980 when she's 10 years old. Um, and so during this time, um, the Islamic Re Revolution pardon me, um, begins to take place. Um, and so the story is told about her childhood from her perspective, um, and, and that's of a young girl who's part of an upper middle class family um, within Iran. So, um, you know, it's important to take into account that um, her perspective uh, may, may differ greatly from other people who were living or growing up in Iran during that time um, because she was part of an upper middle class family. Um, so there, uh, the the trains of thought that she was exposed to maybe more, um, I guess, uh, you know, more Western. Um, and she may have had more access to um, different resources in terms of learning about um, what was going on politically around her and also what was going on politically outside of her country. Um, now, that being said, uh, it was a time of great um, upheaval and religious extremism. Um, the Shah of Iran was exiled, and then following that, there was a period of violence, um, and the Iranian government uh, ended up declaring war against uh, neighboring Iraq. So um, this is kind of all going on in the background of uh, Margie, uh, Margie's life, as she was called as a child, um, until one day a missile, missile hit her family street, um, and it, it missed her house, but it ended up uh, killing her neighbors, um, including one of which was a, a good friend of hers. And um, so with her own eyes, she saw the devastation um, that was happening to the people around her and how, and, and really felt affected by how closely um, these things were happening to her. Um, so uh, at following this, Margie is sent to Europe, to Austria, um, to continue her studies and also to protect her, to escape the war. Um, now, the story leaves off there. It's, it's a fairly quick read, but it does continue in volume two called Persepolis II, The Return. So um, following her time in Europe, about four years, um, during which um, she, she comes to a lot of terms about growing up and also um, dealing with the catastrophes that she has seen firsthand and how that has personally affected her uh, mental well-being. Um, she lives in Iran again after that time. Um, and that particular volume talks about her as an adult uh, and her life in Iran during that time before she does eventually return to Europe, in this case, um, Paris. So um, I know there's some people who aren't really big fans of graphic novels. However, um, you may want to give this one a chance. Uh, I feel that graphic novels are a great vehicle to um, present biographical stories, particularly when it, it's autobiographical and, it, and the, the author and the artist is, is telling their own story in their own voice. Um, so if you like coming of age stories, if you are uh, wanting to learn more about what life was like in Iran, particularly during the cultural um, or the Islamic revolution, um, 
wanting to learn more about the life of girls and women during that time and also how uh, war affected people of all ages. Um, you may want to give Persepolis as well as Persepolis 2 a try. And there's also a third volume, which is sort of a spin-off of Satrapi's work. It's called Embroideries. And that volume deals most specifically with the lives of girls and women in the Middle East. Wonderful, thank you, Liz. So do you think that the graphic novel format in this specific case added something to the story and did something for the story that it wouldn't have been able to have without that if it were written as a novel? Um, there's just something about about um, the medium and, and it's, you know, the subgenre of the, the bi biography within graphic mm -hmm. novels that I feel, um, you know, it gives you a, a deeper dive into the story of the person without necessarily describing everything to you. So through the illustrations, it kind of in, informs you in that way. So it's like a different way of um, getting all that information. Um, but I feel like really effective and in, in some cases, maybe even more more succinct. Then you kind of see what they're trying to tell you as opposed to um, interpreting um, what they're trying to tell you in your mind's eye. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, thank you so much, Liz. So for my final pick, I have chosen, it's actually a bit of an older book, but it is uh, part of a series and the newest one just came out last year. So my pick is Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. And uh, this would fit into the category of Shuttle to the Past um, as it takes place in, starts in 1945, um, just following the Spanish Civil War. And uh, this book follows a young boy named Daniel Semper. And at the beginning of the book, he is 10 years old and he wakes up one morning very, very upset because he can no longer remember what his mother's face looks like. Uh, so his mother passed away and he's so worried that he's, he's going to forget her, that he's not going to remember her. So his father kind of takes him in his arms and says, it's okay, Daniel, I will remember for the both of us. Um, I, that is something that I like, we, we will be able to remember her together. Because of this experience, uh, Daniel's father decides that it is time for him to share something with Daniel. Uh, so he takes him outside, it is 5 a.m. in the morning, and he takes him outside and he says, Daniel, you're not allowed to tell anyone what I'm about to show you. And so he takes him down the street and he takes him to this dark door and he knocks on the door, he's welcomed by this old gentleman, and they're brought inside to this beautiful hall, um, lots like kind of a rounded hall space, and off of this hall are rows and rows in labyrinth form of bookshelves, covered and covered in books. And his father says, welcome to the cemetery of forgotten books. Now, Daniel, because this is your first time visiting the Cemetery of Forgotten Books, you, it is your responsibility to pick a book and be that book's protector. So you are going to pick a book and it is up to you to make sure that that book does not get forgotten, to make sure that that book lives on no matter what. So Daniel goes out into this labyrinth of bookshelves and he starts looking through all of these books and there's one that catches his eye and it's, it's a red covered kind of a wine colored book with gold writing on it. And the title of it is The Shadow of the Wind by Julian Carax. And Daniel grabs that book and he brings it home and he just devours everything in that book. And he, he decides that he has to learn more about who this author is and read more of his work. So Daniel starts to figure out who this person is, starts to look into who wrote this book. And he discovers that the author has actually disappeared, as has every other written work that he has done, leaving Daniel's copy of The Shadow of the Wind the only surviving copy of any of Julian Carax's works. So Daniel continues on this journey trying to figure out exactly what happened to this author. Um, at the same time, he's trying to protect this book that he has found and that he has fallen in love with. Um, his journey kind of spans through his adolescence, through his through his teenage years, through his early adulthood, 
Um, you kind of follow his story there. You also start to learn, go back in time and learn about Julian Crax's story as well. Um, and as Daniel searches more and more to find out what happened to this author, he realizes that he is in more danger than he thought and that there are a lot of people who will do pretty much anything to get this book out of his hands and make sure that this book disappears. And as its protector, Daniel feels like that cannot happen. So it's a very, it's a book about books. So if you really like to read books about books, um, this is a wonderful story. It is the first of a series um, that kind of goes forward from this point as well as backwards from this point to tell the entire story of multiple generations of this family and multiple connections to this cemetery of forgotten books. Um, it takes place in Barcelona and you learn quite a bit about uh, Spanish history, about the Spanish Civil War and about the culture um, in Barcelona as well. And I uh, absolutely loved it. It took me a little bit to get into it, but I absolutely loved this book once I got into it and I would recommend it. All right. Well, that is the last of our Shuttle 2 books. Thank you so much, everyone, who has brought your favorites from around the world to our book chat today. It has been so wonderful to chat all about the different books uh, coming from so many different parts of the world. Uh, I think I have definitely grown my to-be-read list uh, quite a bit from today's episode. <laughs> Does anyone have any final words before we say goodbye today? Oh boy, right. yeah, you you put us on the spot. I did, I you know, I did. The spot. I like, did, I, I did. I, I saved all my words. I saved all my words. Oh, <laughs> I saved all my words to talk good. That's fair, that is fair. <laughs> But no, um, I think there's a lot of great book lists if you're interested in taking a shuttle to any of these places um, on the library's website under Spaceopoly. And oh, it looks like I might Look have... Look at that, Sadie. Oh, Look at that. I'm prepared. I'm prepared. You are ready. <laughs> yeah. And there's always so much more and there's always so much being published. Um, yeah. So, so don't always... reread books. Don't waste your time rereading books. <laughs> So much more to publish, as she just said. Every true, time you reread a book, you discover something new about the book and about yourself. Just saying. And then every time you read a new book, you discover even more that you don't know about. Or you discover that you don't like that book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then you're the one who insists on continuing to read it, where I'm like, like, let's ditch that and pick something else. So yeah, but you got to get to the end because maybe like the last three pages really pull it out of the hat. The three pages is gonna make it worth it. The whole thing, the like three hundred pages of like torture and suffering for that three pages. Mm -mm. If maybe? they're really good, I, I, yeah. If they're really good, they sometimes they'll sometimes mm -hmm. be enough to convince me to read something else by that author or the next book in the series. Yeah. No, yeah, although once really once good. burned. Although I, I say I <laughs> I say that except I did that recently where I read the first book and I was like, I don't care for this. And then I immediately picked up their second book and was also like, I don't care for this either. <laughs> mm -hmm. So so maybe That's... I do need to quit while I'm ahead. But it was like yeah. ten pages in before I realized that it was the same author. So <laughs> <laughs> what's the saying? Fool fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame mm -hmm. on me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Shame. Yep. Shame. <laughs> yep. Well, on that wonderful note, talking about shame and rereading of books, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us to get today. Again, we are promoting our wonderful summer reading club, Space Opoly. So you can find the board at portmoodylibrary.ca forward slash SRC. And you can also find book lists for each of our categories there as well. So if you need some suggestions, uh, if you have read all of the books that we talked about today and are looking for some more suggestions that could fit into those categories, uh, you will find lists on that mm -hmm. uh, website as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, who is watching this later as well. If you would like to comment in the section while you watch the video on your favorite books for the shuttle, and I will be putting our selections from today into the comments below as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.